Hello and welcome to Memo Anime Recaps. Do not forget to like and subscribe. Several years ago, Japan was hit by an apocalyptic virus that took the lives of millions of its citizens. Ever since then, countless attempts have been made to synthesize a usable vaccine to combat the virus. Years and years passed by with no progress in finding a cure for the disease. Ten years later, however, humanity made a breakthrough and the vaccine, Norma Jean, was finally synthesized. Test trials were conducted until it was finally proven useful for public use. Uma Shu, the story's main protagonist, was an average high schooler finding his way through the harsh life of his Japanese high school. Being the shy and reserved guy he is, Shu always finds it hard to make real friends during his school hours. So, he would often create conversations with people by rolling with whatever they said. Life's been normal for him up until one fateful night when the impossible happened. In a heavily guarded facility, an unidentified lady escapes her electronic dungeon and makes a run for dear life under the guidance of some dude. As she makes her way through the intense factory, several robotic guards chase after her and fire heavy-duty rounds at her with the intent to take her out. Thankfully, the lady is able to escape the enemy clutches into an uncompleted building. The following morning, Shu takes his normal daily commute to his high school. While on his ride to school, a lady who seems to be crushing on him walks up to him and talks to him about something random. Shu, however, seems to be more interested in the armor tanks stationed around the city. He lets his concerns known to the girl, and she tells him that it's the city's contingency plan against an incident that happened the previous night. Shu remains quiet for the rest of the trip and gets to school in one piece. At school, Shu gets into a fight with one of his classmates, Suta, who chastises him for neglecting their group work. Yahiro, the other calmer classmate, steps in to quell any growing quarrel before the teacher walks in. School goes on normally for Shu as there seems to be no problems for him. A little insight is then given to the state of Japan as it is at that moment. Apparently other countries had stepped in to provide aid for Japan in her time of need. Now that it's almost over, the countries are beginning to pull off their help. After school, Shu walks to a familiar uncompleted building and finds the egoist singer, Inori, sitting and singing alone. Shocked by her wonderful voice, Shu stumbles on a beer can and makes too much noise. Inori immediately stops her song to see who's there with her. Shu springs himself a string of apologies. However, Inori wasn't too worried about him as she was fixated on the view of his hometown from her CCTV. When she finally speaks to him, she shows him a rubber band material and tells him they have to get it to some guy named Guy. Shu stares at the rubber band material and begins to see flashes of some weird things. Before he makes sense of them, a band of soldiers led by their major, Major Gwyn, breaks into the building, captures Inori, and drags her out. Shu sits there wallowing in self-pity and weakness. When they're already gone with Inori, he recalls his final moments with her and drowns himself in shame. Just then, Inori's robot, Fu Neru, or Neru for short, rushes towards and displays something for him to see. Shu recognizes the map and also recalls the last words Inori told him about delivering something to a guy named Guy. So he picks the vial and begins his journey to find Guy. Somewhere else, Shu's mother, Haruka, and her partner discuss a few of their research findings with their commander. In the meantime, Major Gwyn and his peeps interrogate Inori on the whereabouts of the vial she had with her. As expected, Inori refuses to give them any vital information. As a result, Major Gwyn decides to do the most inhumane thing one could ever think of. To punish her silence, he names every member of that neighborhood as infected and orders his men to execute them. Shu, on the other hand, arrives at the destination on the robot. There, he meets a few thugs who try to force him into releasing the vial of Norma Jean into their hands. Shu begs them to let him go, but they decide to beat him the hell up. Thankfully, Guy and his partner, Ayase, arrive just at the right time to beat the shit out of all the thugs. After sending them packing, Guy faces Shu and asks after Inori. Shu turns up silent and disappoints Guy. Before he gets a chance to speak, however, a loud bang is heard somewhere in the distance. Guy and his men immediately rush in to offer assistance, as Major Gwyn's men are trashing the place and killing anybody they can find. During the fight, Inori gets freed from the van she was kept in. She faces a huge robot and is about to be destroyed. However, Shu ran towards her and saved her. Out of appreciation for his help, Inori's body undergoes a transformation that takes him into a trance that allows him to see former memories of himself and Inori. When he's done, he suddenly has an idea of what to do. Shu suddenly goes silent, and his countenance changes. He places his hands on Inori's chest and transforms her into a sword. Then, he uses Inori, who's now a sword, to slash open the robots attacking him. Almost immediately, Major Gwyn's team notices the damage done to Lieutenant Saeg's robots. Another one of the robots immediately rushes in to attack Shu, but this scares the living hell out of him as he jumps up and uses the long sword in his hand to slash the missiles sent towards him in half. Guy and his subordinate could see Shu take down the robot attacking him a few meters away. When he's fully immobilized by the robot that was attacking him, he runs over to Inori who is still passed out on the ground. He picks her up and calls her name. 
only to watch the sword he dropped previously morph back into Inori's body. As he wonders what to do, the robot, Fu Neru, comes bearing a message from Guy, who was telling Shu to get Inori out of that vicinity as fast as possible. In the meantime, war robot pilot Ayasi steps in to help Shu and Inori escape. Her opponent is the deadly son of the Supreme Commander, Daryl. It takes Daryl mere seconds for him to completely pulverize Ayasi's robot into pieces. After the fight, Major Gwyn gets news about a foot soldier, Shu, who handled a whole lieutenant like Seeg and brought him down like a piece of paper. While he whines and throws a tantrum like a little kid, the terrible Daryl enters the office to tell him about the new model of robots he's created to fight in the war with him. Gwyn tries to get up close and personal with Daryl. Boiled Brat pushes him back and leaves the office smiling like a maniac. Gwyn gets seriously pissed and orders his men to widen their search and destroy everything in their path. In an abandoned building, Guy, Shu, and Inori are seen resting and preparing themselves to leave for their base. Speaking to Shu, Guy phones HQ to check in on Ayase. After confirming that she's alright, he hangs up the call and turns to Shu. Inori wakes at that instant and asks for Guy's thoughts on her delivery. Guy lets her know that he's disappointed about her giving Shu the guilty crown sword. Inori bows her head in shame and Shu tries to let Guy know that Inori tried her best. However, Guy tells him a little information about the power he was given. Apparently, the Guilty Crown is one of the three powerful genome serums developed by Gwyn's company. This Guilty Crown has the ability to draw out the hidden power of the human genome and turn it into physical objects called voids. Now that Shu has been given such power, he has no choice but to join their cause and fight the evil that plagues Japan. Shu is left with his tail between his legs as he wonders what to do. While he takes a chill pill on the ground, one of Shu's guys phones Guy to tell him about Daryl arriving on the scene to use his infamous kaleidoscope to wipe out the Rapongi district. While everyone expects Guy and his band of rebels who call themselves the Underworld to fold and cower in their tiny houses, Guy actually chooses to fight back and take down Daryl and his band of merry men once and for all. To begin their operation, Shu and Inori climb through the vents to get to their positions and wait for the kill signal. While moving through the vents, Shu witnesses the Special Virus Disaster Response Bureau, aka Antibodies, beat up one of the residents in Rapongi and ask them for their leader's location. Just outside their building, the antivirus squad, led by Daryl, executes some residents in the district. Shu cannot believe the horror unfolding before his eyes. Mere seconds after the execution, Guy gives the kill order. Daryl gets oddly excited and quickly hops into his robot to fight the rebels attacking them. Guy and his people stall him for a little bit so they can get access to their main mobile base. This plan seemed to work for a while until Daryl walked right into their trap. Guy pauses for a little while and phones Gwyn and his men, ordering them to release their hostages and surrender. Of course, Gwyn would never bow down to terrorists. Thinking he has the ultimate trump card, he takes out the kaleidoscope to use on the rebels. He walks outside his base confidently and challenges the leader of the Undertakers to a face-off. Guy shows up and talks down on Gwyn and his men for murdering innocent people. Gwyn asks him about the vial containing the genetic drug they stole. He even gives them an ultimatum to release the drug. Still, Guy refuses to spill the beans. Instead, he silently readies his men to strike. When the time is right, Shu comes out of his hiding place with his guilty crown and not only steals the kaleidoscope, but also takes down all of Gwyn's robots and men with it. This shines a new ray of hope on the eyes of the residents of Rapongi who've been hopeless of anything good ever happening to their little town. As he stares into space in awe of what he just did, Shu receives the one thing he's almost never received from Guy before, praise and an offer to join the Undertakers. Shu refuses to join them and returns to school the next day. Unfortunately for him, Inori transfers to the exact same school to watch over him. After watching a video released by the Undertakers, Shu's school teacher informs his students to report any activity resembling that of the Undertakers to the authorities. Everyone recognizes Inori as the egoist singer as soon as she joins their class. After class, everyone flocks around the egoist star to ask a question or two about her past and current activity. It gets so much that Yahiro, Shu's second friend, steps in to stop his mates from overwhelming poor Inori. Shu witnesses everything from afar and appreciates his friend for coming through for Inori when she needs him. During PE, Shu and Sauda talk a little about Inori. Shu calls Inori a doll and incurs Suda's anger. After receiving the necessary insult for his disrespect, Shu gets off his PE and heads back home. He finds Inori at the entrance to his house and asks her what she is doing there. Inori ignores him and opens the door before walking in to change her clothes. Shu tries to get the reason or memo behind her actions but she doesn't seem to care. Instead, she asks him for some onigiri. Elsewhere, in a lab, Kato and his partner Haruka, aka Shu's mom, 
report to their bosses about the Norma gene and its discovery in Rapungi. They talk about the distribution channels and set up a plan to work their way around a major distributor they could manipulate into fishing out Guy. After the meeting, Kato and his people begin interrogating an unidentified man. After finishing her rice ball, Inori talks to Shu for the first time asking him what he thinks about her being there at his place. Before Shu could get a chance to talk, someone rang his doorbell. He answers the doorbell and finds Yahiro there at his entrance. Apparently, Yahiro wanted to go see a horror movie with Shu so they could bond more. He asks Shu what he thinks about it, but again, Shu gets interrupted by Inori, who walks outside and asks him to follow her. Instinctively, Shu follows Inori all the way to a public staircase. There, they find Guy making a phone call and wait for a while for him to hang up before speaking to him. When he's done, Guy makes sure no one's on their trail. When they're safe, he tells them about a stalker, or more accurately, a student from their school who witnessed the entire incident in Roppongi. He calls that person Sugar, and mentions to Shu that the person is a major dealer in the addictive drug, Norma Jean. Now Shu has to work with Inori to catch the person red-handed. Shu puts up a few arguments, asking Guy how they would go about it. Guy tells him to use his guilty crown powers to draw out the void in each of his classmates to find the one that has a sheer-shaped void. Once they find a void shaped like a shear, they found their guy. The following day, Shu and Inori lie and wait for their first test subject. The duo discuss a few things about the void energy and then wait for the right time to strike. When that time comes, Shu steps out of his hiding place and accidentally touches a girl's chest. The entire room stands still for a second and Shu makes a run for it. Before he knows it, he's online and is named the bad guy for touching a girl's boobs. Thankfully, Shu manages to hide out of sight. While in hiding, Inori approaches him and gives him a few pointers on how to correctly bring out the void from people. Shu thanks her for the advice and sets off on his next test subject, Sauda. This time, he manages to bring out his void, which is shaped like a big camera. Not their guy. Shu gets very happy about his progress and begins checking out everyone's void for a sheer-shaped one. After a whole day of failed attempts, Shu and Inori take a break to discuss more about voids. At one point in their discussion, Shu becomes very curious and asks Inori why her void is shaped like a sword. Before she could answer, one of the girls catches up to him. Yahiro helps Shu out this time and takes them to the gym. There he speaks a few suspicious things to Shu which makes him very curious to know about Yahiro's void. Shu musters enough courage and calls him Sugar. Yahiro doesn't even try to hide it. He loses his shit and blames Shu for bringing tragedy upon his family. Yahiro walks towards Shu and holds him up to chest level. Shu puts his hands inside Yahiro's chest and takes out his void only to see it shaped like a spear. Almost immediately, Inori holds up her gun to shoot Yahiro. However, Shu asks her to put the gun down and allow him to handle the situation. When Yahiro wakes up, he and Shu make a promise never to cross each other again. Problem solved, right? Well, the very next day, Yahiro betrays Shu as they're on their way to school. Their train stops at an unexpected bus stop, and Yahiro pushes Shu outside the train to meet Segai and his men from the antibody organization. He's placed under arrest immediately. After placing him in handcuffs, Segai and his men escort Shu to their quarters. Meanwhile, Inori receives word from their spy on the train not to interfere with what's going on to avoid exposure. On his way back to their facility, Shu deeply regrets trusting Yahiro with his life. Unknown to him, he's about to be used in a rescue operation. When his classmates hear the news about his arrest, they all freak out and wonder how in hell that could happen on a seemingly normal morning. Meanwhile, Sagai communicates with one of his bosses to give him an update on Shu's arrest and all that. He suspects Shu to be an integral member of the Undertakers, and believes he can manipulate him into telling him the whereabouts of Guy. He then mentions a few more info and facts, not forgetting to show his boss a video Guy released to inform them of their next attack. After his meeting, Segai finally gets into the same vehicle as Shu to be transported to a friendlier facility. There, he tells Shu about Yahiro's story before taking him to see Yahiro's brother, Jun, in their isolation ward. So the deal with Yahiro is that his brother was critically infected by the virus and is currently undergoing treatment in their isolation ward. To keep up with the cost of keeping his brother alive, Yahiro has to follow Segai's instructions to bring the Undertakers to their knees. Segai then narrates the viral outbreak that happened in Japan 10 years ago and tries to bend the truth to make Guy look like the bad guy in the entire situation. Dumshu begins to see the Undertakers from another perspective. Sagai sees his manipulation is working and tries to justify killing the residents of Rapongi the other day. Again, Dumshu believes everything and asks for some more proof from Sagai to justify his claims. Sagai shows him a video recording of a mass murderer named Kido Kenji, who's currently resting in their dungeons from a plethora of murder charges. Shu takes a deep breath, and wonders who could be telling the truth. Just then, Sigai provides him with an option. He places a transmitter pen on the table and asks Shu to take it. Whenever he's near Guy, he should press the blue button twice and ping their location. 
so they can destroy Guy once and for all. He also lets Shu know that if he tries to double-cross them, he'll be forced to ask Inori to use the transmitter pen. Meanwhile, Inori returns to the abandoned building she was in initially and watches a recording of Shu fighting the enemies. A few hours later, Guy disguises himself as Shu's lawyer, Mason, and sneaks into the facility where Shu's been kept. After getting face-to-face -face with Shu as his lawyer, Guy tells him to calm his balls while they get their plans into place. Shu, who is about to scream his lungs out, keeps his mouth shut and lets Guy's team do their thing. Ayase and the others immediately start hacking into the facility's network while Guy stalls Shu. During their discussion, Guy mentions that they're there to free another member of their team, Kido Kenji. He then tells him about a few more relevant things about their plan, but Shu tells him he wants no part of it. As he freaks out and blames Guy for all his tragedy, the power goes out in the facility. Guy immediately begins the operation, and his team responds according to plan. Shu thinks long and hard about his decision, but Inori soon phones in to tell Shu to wait for her while she approaches him. Guy gets very annoyed as he initially told Inori to stay away from the mission. Her being there can only mean she's there to save her Shu. Before he gets to iron things out, a few guards arrive to stop Guy and Shu. The duo take care of the guard and continues on to find Kido Kenji. In the meantime, the guards from the facility try to transport Kido to another facility, but Guy's men race up to find him. Shu, who's already escaped from his cell, meets up with Ayase and her battle robot. Ayase asks him to spill out everything he did to manipulate Inori so she'll never disobey Guy. Shu ignores her request and keeps on running for dear life. Segai, on the other hand, remains calm as he searches for Kido in the ruckus unfolding before him. Guy and his people catch up to the guards transporting Kido Kenji. Before they get too far, they blow up the bridge the guards were running on and release Kido. Shu quickly rushes over to Kido and unleashes his own void. He unapologetically fires the gun at an oncoming war robot and finds out about the hidden powers of the gun. Apparently, it turns out that the gun could manipulate gravity and render anything it hits weightless for a little while. Shu, while getting the idea behind the gun, sees Inori falling down from the roof of the facility to come see him. Before she hits the ground, he quickly hits the gun on max settings and fires it at Inori so she can be weightless for a few minutes while he tries to reach her. He jumps into midair and catches onto Inori. Then he takes out her void, which is the legendary longsword, and uses it to slice open the missiles and war robots attacking him. Seigai stands somewhere on the ground floor in awe over the immense power and focus Shu is displaying. In a matter of minutes, the entire facility is burned to the ground and Shu is now a free man. Before leaving him, Guy asks him one more time to join the Undertaker or risk being left alone. Shu gives it another thought and decides to go with Guy and join the Undertakers. Upon arriving at the Undertaker's hideout, Shu keeps calm and remembers Seigai's words about the transmitter with him. After settling in their new hideout, Guy and his team talk a little about Kido, who is still sleeping the exhaustion away. When they're done with the discussion, Guy decides to formally reintroduce Shu to the entire Undertaker team. He calls everybody's attention and introduces Shu as their trump card. Then he moves forward to talk about their next mission, which is commandeering a military satellite they call Leucosite. The Leucosite, which was originally meant to be fully operational in three days' time, is rumored to be vulnerable and susceptible to third-party hacks. So Guy tells his team they all have a three-day window to get their shit together, and get on a mission to steal the leukocyte for themselves. And if worse comes to worst, destroy it. After hearing all he has to say, some of his subordinates protest his plan. They all just returned from a mission and haven't recovered from the fatigue yet. However, Guy ignored his comment and immediately assigned Ayes to be in charge of training Shu for the next three days for a mock test. If by the end of the three-day training, he manages to pass the test, he'll join them in their mission to commandeer Leucocyte. After leaving, Shu underestimates Ayase's strength seeing as she was using a wheelchair. Ayase shows him who's boss before calling it a day. The following morning, Ayase walks in on Shu unclothed and warns him never to sleep late again. After dressing himself up, Shu waits up to listen to his new trainer brief him on his training. While she talks, Shu spots the transmitter pen in Ayase's hands. He tries to get it from her hand without raising any suspicion, but Ayase refuses to give it to him. Instead, she promises to give him the transmitter pen only if he can pass the mock test. Shu sighs and agrees to her terms. Up next, Ayase introduces Shu to one of her colleagues, Argo, for a little physical training before beginning the real thing. Argo beats Shut down in a second and deems him useless for their mission. Over the next few scenes, Shu undergoes a heavy training regimen from Ayase and other senior members of the Undertaker Rebel Group. Inori helps him with shooting practice at one point while Ayase supervises them. On the night before the mock test, Sagai informs his boss about his plans for Shu. In the meantime, Shu finds himself in a bar after training. He sees one of the kids there talking fondly about Guy. When they're gone, 
he insults Guy as being selfish and arrogant. However, a guy there tells him to take his words back. Naturally, Shu does the right thing and walks over to Inori's studio. There, he finds her singing as usual and interrupts her a little before sitting down to speak with her. He tells her just how happy he was to see her back on the prison break mission. He also tries getting close to her, but Inori pushes him away as Guy had ordered her to stay away from him. After hearing the order from Guy again, Shu follows Inori as she walks to Guy's room and locks the door after her. Shu is heartbroken and runs blindly into a dark tunnel. There he bumps into Ayase and throws her off her wheelchair. Ayase senses what is wrong with him and teases him about his feelings for Inori. Shu gets the idea that Guy is having an affair with Inori when, in reality, it's the total opposite. Shu gets even more heartbroken as he wallows in self-pity and tells Ayase about his weaknesses. Ayase feels sorry for him and tells him to pass the mock test the following day so he can feel good about himself. Shu thanks her for her help and tries to help her get up from the ground. However, Ayase tells him to leave so she can do it by herself and he obeys. While in the room, Inori takes care of Guy as he receives treatment for some unknown ailment that he had. Very early the following morning, Guy finds out that the antibody squad has hired some mercenaries to help them stop Undertaker. Guy ignores them and returns to his safe house at Point Delta. To win the mock test, Shu is to maneuver his way around a war robot to reach his goal. After it begins, everyone looks down on Shu, who was really having a bad time getting past the robot. At one point, he runs into Argo and extracts his void object, which is a harmless black hole gun. Shu uses his brain and stuns the robot so he can get to his destination safely to win the test. Everybody gathered around him to congratulate him on his win. Ayase also returns the transmitter pen to him and lauds him for a good job. At that moment, Kido wakes up and also congratulates Shu. However, the congratulations are really short-lived, as the entire group is directed to watch the horrible explosion that took down one of their hideouts, the one Guy was in. Apparently, the antibody organization had tested out the leukocyte satellite destructive beam on Guy's hideout and left it in a very bad state. Upon realizing the devastating effects of the leukocyte blaster, Ayase and the others try their best to reach Guy. Thankfully, they're able to get a signal from him, telling them about the immense damage the blast from leukocyte caused to Point Delta. A dispatch is immediately sent to recover Guy and bring him to a camp somewhere around town. There, Guy receives the treatment he needs to survive his injuries before he debriefs the team about their new plan. When he's done receiving treatment, he gathers his team and debriefs them on their new mission. So in the next few hours, Guy and his team are to infiltrate the leukocyte control facility in a dam and hack into the leukocyte control mechanism so they can throw it out of orbit and save Japan from dictatorship. Now all that's left is to dish out roles to every member of the Undertaker so the operation goes down smoothly. At one point, Shu protests Guy's plans as it is suicidal and risky to everyone involved. Sadly for him, nobody agreed with his argument as they all sided with Guy. Shu covers his head in shame and rushes outside to take some air. Inori joins him later on and stops him from overthinking his arse out. She dishes out some instructions for him and warns him to follow everything she says in the letter. A few hundred meters away, Segai and his boss discuss a possible attack on their base from the Undertakers. The boss, although wishes for the entire launch of the leukocyte to be successful, tells Segai to be prepared nonetheless. In the mechanical section, Daryl fine-tunes his war robot and promises to go way harder on Umashu and the Undertakers the next time they face each other. Inori, on the other hand, is seen soaking in the early morning mist as she recalls her previous moments with Shu. Not too far away, Guy is seen soliloquizing about the leukocyte attack. Apparently, Kyo, his handler, wasn't dead after the explosion. However, due to the pain she was feeling at the moment, Guy had to take her life and put her out of her misery. Unknown to Guy, Shu was at the other side of the door near him eavesdropping on his thoughts. When he finds out, it's already too late. Shu still sees him as a bad leader. He even throws a punch at his face, which Guy collects gracefully. Shu is surprised to see Guy punish himself for being a leader of the most recognized rebel group in Japan. He peers into his eyes and convictions a little more and changes his thoughts about him. Guy is still a good man. He helps Guy up and gets ready for his mission clearly on the Undertaker's side. In the next scene, the Undertakers begin their attack on the leukocyte control facility at the dam. Ayas uses one of Daryl's war robots to fight Daryl himself and his new war robot, while the others take out the guards and brute force their way into the safe house. Guy moves with Kido, Inori, and Shu to find the control room. When they do, they blast a hole in the door and enter it. The guards immediately begin flooding that floor, but Inori stays back and holds them all off so her people can get to the core control room safely. Almost immediately, the higher-ups are alerted, and they begin taking preventive steps to prevent any harm 
from touching their core control mechanism. Daryl, on hearing about the infiltration, rushes all over to the control room and fires his guns everywhere to destroy Guy and Shu. Shu holds a gun to hack into the core control rods while Guy takes down Daryl's war robot. Guy takes down the robot and finds out the bad news way too late. During his fight with Daryl, he'd accidentally shot a bullet into the core control rod and damaged it. Now that it's damaged, the Leukocyte satellite would fall out of orbit and crash into Japan. With the power and transmission out in the entire city of Tokyo, Guy and his people are left with no other choice but to collaborate with their enemies to save the whole of Tokyo and Japan. Guy gathers Shu, Inori, and Kido to meet up with Seigai. When they meet, he makes a deal with Seigai. While Guy uses the transmitter pen from Shu to redirect the satellite towards a safe crash site, Seigai erases Shu's name from their systems for life. Seigai has no choice but to accept the terms, however unpleasant it sounds. Guy immediately springs into action and begins searching for a way to find a safe crash site. He plans to sacrifice himself by holding onto the pen till the end. However, Inori and Shu weren't about to let that happen, as Inori surrendered her void, which is the Guilty Crown Longsword, to Shu for his use. Shu, after recovering the sword, rushes over to Guy's location and urges him to let him try and stop the alignment of the Leukocyte and the second satellite. They have a 30-second window before this happens. Ayase keeps the countdown and signals Shu when it's the right time to hit the satellite. When the time is right, Shu expends all the power in his arsenal and condenses it into one single blast that destroys the Leukocyte satellite before it reaches Earth. With the satellite gone and the threat neutralized, everyone settles down to watch the aurora resulting from the explosion. Shu accepts his fate and calls himself an official Undertaker member. Elsewhere, Kato meets with an unidentified woman who congratulates him for helping her unlock a particular lady who'll help them in their next plan. A few days after the Leukocyte incident, Shu returns to school. However, this time, he gets bullied by some of the kids there over his arrest by the GHQ. Shu tries running away from them to avoid any further insults from them. To his surprise, however, the head of the student council union, Kuhoin Arisa, heir to the Kuhuin group, steps and slaps the hell out of the students for insulting their fellow students for something out of his control. She then escorts Shu to his classroom to make sure he's never insulted over his arrest again. Thankfully, the students get the memo and stop trying to bully him for his arrest. Arisa gets very happy with the maturity displayed by his classmates and heads back to her own classroom. During their lunch break, Shu eats together with his people and discusses the Kuhuin group and the fate of Arisa as the heir of the company. At one point in their discussion, Hare, the girl who has a crush on Shu, asks Shu about Yahiro, but he seems to be nowhere to be found recently. They refuse to put much thought into their life as they continue eating their food. By evening time, Shu's mom, Haruka, returns home and finds Inori and Shu sitting on her living room couch. Shu tries his best to make his mother understand his predicament. Haruka, who does not seem to care much, heads off to the kitchen to make dinner for their guest, Inori. Elsewhere, Guy holds a meeting with his people. Apparently, their last fight has them short on weapons and funding. If they don't find a weapon soon, they may run out of funds to keep their group alive. In the meantime, Arisa, while taking her bath in the shower, recalls her last moments with her grandpa, who invited her to a party on a yacht the next day. After the flashback, she sobs a little over how out of control her life is. By nightfall, Haruka finds her son in his room arranging his clothes. She talks to him about Inori and compliments just how beautiful she is. She gives her son the thumbs and continues searching her wardrobe for her dress. When she finds it, she gets it ironed and ready for the next day's party on the yacht. On the next night, Sigai and his people meet with the impeccably strong Dan. Now Dan is an explosive guy who loves bombing things to extinction. He found out earlier that day that the higher-ups of the country were having a party on a yacht in quarantined waters. So to prepare for them, he arranged a fleet of surface-to-air missiles and collaborated with the GHQ so they could attack the yacht in the dead of night and possibly destroy it. Meanwhile, Guy and Shu manage to sneak into the yacht. They attack two chaperones and steal their clothing so they can meet with the head of the Kuhuin group and possibly talk to him. After disguising themselves in the changing room, the duo head off to the party to find Kuhuin. While searching for the leader of the group, Shu finds his mother speaking with someone. He gets very scared and rushes back to the changing room to hide from her. Along the way, he bumps into Arisa who follows him to figure out what's wrong. Shu asks Guy to keep Arisa at bay while he hides from his mom. Guy boycotts Arisa on the way and stops her from getting too close to Shu. He teases her a little bit and forces her to give him a light slap on the cheek. Dan, on the other hand, prepares his team to prepare the Dragoon missiles to be launched towards the ship. Ayase and her people discover this just in time to relay it to Shu. At first, they advise him to get Guy and get off the ship, but Shu isn't ready to take the cowardly way out. Shu gets off the call and heads back inside to find Jia. He finds Guy having a meeting with the leader of the Kunin group, 
group and calls his attention to the missiles coming towards the ship. Guy immediately cooks up a plan and asks Shu to wait for him on the deck. Then he quickly rushes to get Arisa and brings her up to the ship just so he can lure her into surrendering her void for Shu's use. Well, a missile was coming in hot. With less than 30 seconds left, Shu takes out Arisa's void, which is an impenetrable shield and uses it to dispel the missile completely. Dan gets pissed a little and keeps ordering his men to fire more missiles. Still, Shu stops them all with Arisa's shield void, keeping all passengers safe and sound. When they run out of missiles, Dan is shocked. After the whole party, the head of the Kunin group offered to fund the Undertakers. Everyone receives the good news and is more than happy to hear such good news. Meanwhile, Arisa wakes up to see Guy there beside her. She tries to act all tough and womanly, but Guy sees through her tricks and pats her on the head. The following day, Inori and Shu both go to school together, leaving Haruka behind. Haruka checks a photo of Shu and smiles at the man he's becoming. A few days pass with nothing out of the ordinary happening. On the day of their vacation, Shu and Inori pack their clothes and get ready to head out to Oshima Beach. Haruka plays with him a little bit and asks her son to pay his father's grave a visit while he's there. Shu nods in agreement and gets to the seaport. Moments after they arrive at Oshima, Shu recalls his previous meeting with Guy. Apparently, the Undertakers plan on breaking into a GHQ facility down at the beach resort. Only this time, they need Sauda's void, so he has to come along. Shu sighs and settles into their private family house with Sauda. Later on, they all change into their beach wear to take a dip in the seawater before getting to work. Shu sees Inori in her beautiful beach wear and stares intently at her. Hair, on the other hand, changes into her own beach wear and steals Shu for herself. A few more Undertaker peeps are seen nearby, spectating the kids have fun while they stand guard and watch. After their morning swim session, the ladies change back to their normal clothes and begin to search for Shu. Meanwhile, Shu was busy paying his respects at his father's grave. Guy joins him moments later, and the duo discuss Shu's father and his work as a professor at GHQ. Shu admits to not really having any vivid memory of his dad as he died moments after Lost Christmas when the apocalypse happened. Guy changes the subject matter and shows Shu a secret GHQ facility hidden inside Oshima's forest. Shu asks him about it, and Guy tells him he wants the rock that started it all. That rock is said to have started the entire apocalypse and would prove very useful to them if they can retrieve it. However, for this mission to work, they would need to use Sauda's void, and the mission starts by 10 p.m. that night. Later on, the girls discuss their lives in school while taking their baths in the in-situ sauna. At one point, they all tease each other about their bodies and laugh over it. In the meantime, Suda lets Shu know that he's going to date Inori no matter what happens. Shu, who feels no threat at all, walks towards him and asks Suda if he's willing to go for her tonight. Sauda nods in agreement and gets himself ready to move. Guy, on the other hand, finalizes things with his men before starting the risky mission by 10. Arisa also takes a look at Guy's picture one more time as she wonders who the man could be. Shu hatches a plan with Suda to take Inori on a walk around the resort by nightfall and get close to him before sitting her down in the desired position. Their plan goes on very well and Sauda manages to impress Inori with an egoist song he tried to make. Shu gets the shock of his life when Inori is impressed by his work. Sauda, upon realizing how important his moment was, begins to confess his feelings for Inori. Shu cannot let that happen, so he gets out of his hiding place and takes out Suta's void before he speaks the three magical words. Seconds later, other members of the Undertaker group all walk out of their disguises to inspect the situation. Now that Shu has ruined their chance, all they need to do is move forward and cut their losses. They immediately begin their plan to infiltrate the facility. In another part of the facility, Kato approaches the entrance and opens a door using Shu's father's card. Almost immediately, the facility goes into lockdown. Shu and Guy immediately rush to get the rock before the entire facility locks them inside with no way out. They approach a mechanical room and wait for it to change shape before waltzing into a central safe. They open the safe and find out that the rock has been moved. Turns out Kato had seen them coming, so he moved the rock to a safer place to keep it from them. They immediately abort their mission and return to the resort. The following morning, Sauda wakes up and finds Shu there with him. He asks after Inori and finds out Shu had stopped him the previous night from telling Inori how he truly felt. Sauda gets very pissed at Shu for not telling him he had feelings for Inori. Shu also returns the same energy, telling him that he never knew Sauda felt the same way for Inori. In the end, the duo kiss and put on makeup before returning to the city to continue life as high school students. On their way home, Shu asks Inori to tell him a little more about voids. Inori explains a few things about them, including the fact that they have the potential to change as people's hearts change. Back in the city, Yahiro returns from getting himself and his brother groceries. On getting back to his hideout, 
he finds something suspicious going on there. Yahiro gets paranoid and quickly changes his location with his injured brother, Jun. Mere minutes after his departure, Segai and his men track Yahiro to that exact same location and find nothing thereafter interrogating the people there. However, Segai notices some shards on the ground and concludes that whoever left that place already did so not so long ago. Meanwhile, Shu and Guy discuss a few things about the next mission during a movie scene shoot. Guy tells Shu that he's stepping out for a few days to attend to something that needs his presence. Hare stops by and notices her crush becoming more confident in himself. Although it's a good thing, she still gets worried over the sudden change in his character. By afternoon time, she discusses this same issue with her classmate in an empty classroom. Shu steps by their classroom moments later and accidentally drops his tiger-shaped tea kettle. He says hi, apologizes for the interruption, and then proceeds to get his tea kettle. Hare's friends see this as an opportunity to set up her friend to have some time alone with Shu chan She takes the chance and rushes out of the class, leaving Shu with Hare. In the meantime, the GHQ launched an official investigation into the person who used Shu's father's ID to enter the laboratory. After lessons that day, Hare follows Shu to the convenience store to get some groceries. On their way there, Shu asks Hare if she would have lots of bags after getting her stuff. Hare waits for the right time to confess her feelings to Shu. Suddenly, the train stops and Yahiro, who's been missing for a while, rushes inside and drops a drug casket just before Hare speaks the three magic words. Once he's in, the train immediately starts moving, leaving Yahiro's pursuers behind. Shu calls Yahiro out and urges him to apologize for giving him up to the feds. However, Yahiro refuses to do such a thing. Instead, he teases Shu and asks if he wants to cause a scene right there on the train. Shu realizes he's going to have to calm down a little before asking him any weird questions. He asks Hare to go shopping on her own while he follows Yahiro around for questioning. On their way to an undisclosed location, Yahiro tells Shu the entire truth. Apparently, they threatened to pull the plug on Jun if he didn't betray Shu. Yahiro was prepared to do anything for his brother, so he betrayed Shu without a second thought. Moments later, Yahiro and Shu arrive at the new hideout, where Yahiro asks for some money from Shu so he can keep running with his brother. Unknown to them, they were being watched by the GHQ. Dan phones Segai and informs him of the update. Segai, who knows what to do, gives him the OK sign and prepares for the next phase of their plan. After hearing Yahiro's request for some funds, Shu decides to phone his folks at Undertaker and convince them to take Yahiro into their bosom. His plan works, and Yahiro thanks him greatly. Segai and his team, on the other hand, lie and wait secretly at the entrance of Yahiro's hideout to wait for their exit. When they show up, he opens fire on them all. Yahiro and Shu wheel Jun, Yahiro's brother, out of the line of fire. When he's safe, Shu proceeds to take out Yahiro's void to fight against Sagai and his men. Initially, Yahiro thought Shu was going to betray him, but Shu tells him to cut the crap and takes out the shear in Yahiro's void to fight. Seconds into the fight, Daryl arrives with his war robot and challenges Shu to a fight. Shu tries to lead Daryl away from Jun. This works for a little while, but Jun's whining causes Daryl to face him and fire an extension cord at Jun. Jun gets hit by the extension cord from Daryl and is pinned to the wall. Just when everyone thought it was over, something weird happened. Jun's Endlave, which is the apocalypse crystal from the disease, detaches itself from Jun's body and attaches itself to Daryl's war robot and corrupts it. Daryl gets very worried as the very machine he trusts to fight him turns against him. All attempts to gain control of his machine prove futile as the machine blows itself out of proportion. Amidst the hubbub, Shu gets transported into Jun's memories. There, he finds out the connection Jun had with his brother, Yahiro, moments before the lost Christmas event happened. Jun begs Shu to end his life as he fears what his brother, Yahiro, has become. He would hate to be the reason his brother keeps going bad and sour. So if saving his brother means he has to die now, then he'll gladly do that without a second thought. After explaining the reason behind his actions, Shu ends it all in one single motion. In his final moments of life, Jun thanks Shu and his elder brother for being there for him while he was alive. Shu gets back to the real world, and takes Yahiro out of the hideout. Yahiro wakes up a few moments later and finds out the truth. Shu just killed his younger brother, Jun. Nearby, Hare, who's been witnessing the entire fight from the onset, opens her eyes wide in surprise as she finds out the truth about Shu. Several nights later, Shu and the Undertakers embark on another mission to intercept a convoy suspected to be transporting the Rock of Life through the highways. Everything seems to be going smoothly until it's Shu's turn to play his part. When the time comes for Shu to take out Inori's longsword for the final attack, he develops cold feet and disappoints everyone. In the twinkle of an eye, the entire plan fails and the Undertakers face heavy fire from the GHQ. Guy keeps his guys in the game, hoping Shu will finally overcome whatever he's going through. Unfortunately, things only get worse as Shu sees flashbacks of June and runs away. 
In the end, Guy is forced to abort the mission and take his troops back home. Shu returns home a failure in the eyes of the Undertaker after messing things up with their last mission. The following morning, Shu wakes up after having a nightmare about his elder sister. Seconds after waking up, Hare walks up to him in the abandoned building and hands him a sandwich. Shu keeps mute and collects the sandwich. Hare tries asking him to open up to her. Unfortunately, Shu wasn't ready to do so as he kept his mouth shut the entire time she was talking. A little while later, he receives a call from Guy summoning him for a meeting. Shu ignores the call and pisses Guy off the more. Up next, Guy meets with Arisa and her grandfather, who's the head of the union group. There, the grandpa asks him for the reason why he's so intent on fighting GHQ. Guy shocks him and Arisa by admitting that he's fighting for a woman. The grandpa laughs out loud and tells him the location of the Rock of Life. Apparently, GHQ is currently planning to transport the rock overseas. Guy thanks him for the information and prepares himself to attack the transport vessel. The following day, Shu returns to school with Hare. Hare is very happy to see Shu back in school and tries her best to cheer him up. However, Shu just keeps his head down and asks after Inori. When Suda comes by to talk to him, he sees the Endlave disease all around him. This scares Shu so much that he screams and runs back to the abandoned building. Ayase visits him moments later to try and talk sense into his head. However, Shu was already far gone as he already lost all belief in himself. Guy also shows up to talk some sense into Shu's head, but Shu remains the coward he is and refuses to step up and fight for Japan's freedom. Disappointed, Guy urges Ayase to leave the coward behind while they go fight for their freedom in peace. Hare, who was nearby eavesdropping, sheds a little tear for Shu's situation. Shu walks back home and finds Inori there. He apologizes for not texting or calling her initially, but Inori only wants to know if he's okay. She gets up from the chair and inches closer to Shu so she can give him some presents. As we know it, cowardly Shu sees monsters again and slaps the present out of her eyes. Inori sobs quietly and sees herself out of Shu's house. In the next scene, Dan and his people all gather in the airport to see Major General Yan off as he leaves the country with the Rock of Life. After waiting for an hour or so, Yan arrives at the airport with the Rock of Life and his secretary. Daryl stands and waits at the end of the elevator to see the Almighty Major General again. To his dismay, he finds him kissing his secretary. Shameful, Daryl thought. On seeing Daryl, Yan closes the elevator and continues moving to the next level. In the meantime, Guy receives his normal treatment before embarking on their next mission. Inori stops by and asks for some clarification. Is she in love with Shu, or is she just scared of him leaving them forever? Guy realizes Inori may have been in love with Shu, so he advises her to survive first before doing anything rash. Hare, while in class, receives a text from Shu, asking her to come see him in the abandoned building. Meanwhile, Haruka interrogates Kato, her former partner, for some information on how he got his hands on her late husband's keycard. Kido smiles and tells her all he knows about Shu and him joining the Undertakers. Naturally, this comes as a huge shock to Haruka, but she keeps her cool. After making all necessary preparations to intercept Yan and his package mid-air, Guy and his men lie and wait for the Major General to show himself so they can strike. What he didn't know was that Sigai had already seen them coming and had planned against it. The Undertakers still continue their plan normally, as they take down the entire fleet of guards protecting Major General's Airbus. They unsuspectingly get into the plane, thinking they'll find Yan there and end him. To their surprise, they find nobody on the plane. Even the pilots are absent. At that point, the plane immediately starts up and begins moving. Sigai kickstarts his plan from then on and activates the Rock of Life. After arriving at the abandoned building, Hare tries to talk to Shu. Shu disrespects her by going in for a kiss. Hare could sense the emotional manipulation going on, so she slaps Shu and talks some sense into his head. She tells him everything she's been able to gather and makes him know that he's already losing his confident self all to an incident he had no control over. She was right though, and thankfully, Shu knew it. However, before he could say anything, the Rock of Life began its full effect. Sagai broadcasts the song from the rock to the whole city and restarts the lost Christmas apocalypse all over again. In a matter of minutes, the entire city of Tokyo gets engulfed in the crystal again, and there's chaos everywhere. Guy gets affected by the crystal as he falls down weak from the pain of the disease. Daryl, on the other hand, gets so pissed at the Supreme Commander that he tracks him and the Secretary down before ending them in that instant. Kato, after realizing the Supreme Commander has been killed, installs himself as the interim leader of the entire military command in Tokyo and assigns them to be under antibody. He declares a level one state of emergency and assigns tasks to each military force around the city. He then holds Haruka hostage and forces her to stay with them in their control room. However, Dan, the strong man, steps in and helps Haruka escape. Unfortunately for him, he loses his life to Segai's bullet. Haruka rushes through the hallway hoping to find some allies along the way. In the meantime, Shu and Hare find out what's happening in the entire city. Ayase puts the blame on Shu for running away like a coward instead of manning up and fighting like a man. 
Shu realizes he has effed up. To make it up to his people, he finds a PA and asks Sauda, Arisa, and Yahiro to come meet him in the abandoned building. Meanwhile, Kato's forces at Haneda recount all the enemy forces remaining in their vicinity. Kato and Segai arrive at Ropongi and prepare themselves to cross the River of Lamentations and stuff. After gathering all the students he needs, Shu becomes very sullen as he wonders what to do in this situation. Guy, on the other hand, keeps trying to find an escape route from the enemy army. They run into Haruka, who keeps asking them about her son. Inori tells Haruka that Shu isn't with them anymore. However, she still believes that he'll come after them in due time. The students keep pestering Shu to tell them what the hell is going on. As the situation becomes more restive, Shu decides to do a little demonstration. He holds hair close to him and unleashes her void power which is a band-aid. He then uses the band-aid to repair the malfunctioning robot, Fiyu Naru, and brings it back to life. This awes everyone there with them, as they keep asking more questions. Shu calms them down, and explains the concept of the void objects to each and every one of them. At one point, Yahiro steps in and challenges Shu to tell them about the Undertakers, and why he would want to save people like them. Shu explains to everybody that the Undertakers saved him from the hellhole he was in, back when he was depressed. He apologizes to everyone for using their void powers earlier on without letting them know, and hopes they will willingly lend him their void power from then on. Thankfully, the people appreciate the thought and offer their support. In the next scene, Haruka, Inori, and Guy break into the cell tower of GHQ and hack into it so Inori's song can reach out to the far ends of the city. With the chaos and restiveness still on the rise, Inori begins her song. Initially, nothing happens. However, as she sings on with her sweet voice, the chaos begins to die down as Inori's void engulfs the entire city. All of a sudden, people who were once infected with the disease healed, and the rock of life was also nullified. Shu and the other students brute force their way to the GHQ facility in Haneda. Along the way, they're attacked by the guards and war robots. However, Shu uses the void of his other classmates to save them all. Daryl gets the news about the students bypassing all levels of security. He gets so pissed that he immediately turns away from his initial mission just so he could stop the students. Shu still manages to get through to the cell tower. He finds Inori singing at the very top and calls her attention to it. Just then, Daryl sneak attacks them, throwing their bus into an accident. While Daryl waits for them to wake up, Shu returns the sneak attack and puts him down. When he's done with Daryl, he jumps way up into the sky and onto the cell tower to meet with Inori. On getting there, he calls out to Inori and distracts her for a second. Just then, someone opens a portal from behind her, grabs her longsword void, and vanishes into thin air. Just then, the entire world is plunged into an even greater darkness as random people in the city including Guy, bleed out profusely. Moments before the person from the portal takes Inori, Guy, who's at his last straw, takes a hit to protect Shu. In his final moments, Guy mutters a few words to Shu, telling him to remember who he really was. With a dreadful look in his eyes, Shu thinks back and remembers a younger version of Guy. Guy, on the other hand, recognizes the person holding Inori as Dath, the gravekeeper, and tells Shu to enter his portal before it closes. Shu immediately gets up and gets into the portal before it closes. Inside the portal, Doth appreciates Shu's bravado for trying to save his friend. However, before he can allow him to enter their domain, he needs to remember his younger life, including his elder sister Mana. Doth shoots a beam of light at Shu's head which reignites his memories and causes him to remember his life before the apocalypse. It all began on a beach when a boy with blonde hair washed up to the shores of the Tokyo beach. Mana, Shu's elder sister, and a younger Shu, helped save the boy from drowning. After reviving him, Mana names the boy Triton as he came from the sea. The following summer, the trio spent a lot of time together playing around and challenging each other. Shu remembers that the blonde boy they saved on the beach grew up to be Guy. Life went well for all of them for a few years until the apocalypse happened. Suddenly, Shu is brought back to the present day by Kato. This time, he finds himself in a weird room with a long staircase. Shu looks up and finds Inori tied up there. After calling her name a few times, Kato shows up and tells him the truth. Apparently, Kato plans to sacrifice Inori just so he can use her to revive Shu's elder sister, Mana. After she's fully revived, then he would propose to her and begin the second wave of the lost Christmas apocalypse. Once he gets the whole picture, Shu tries to interfere with the revival, but Dath shows up and restrains him with the crystals before forcing him to watch Kato revive his older sister. Shu recalls a moment with his elder sister back when she asked him to marry her. What younger Shu didn't know back then was that his elder sister was already infected with the apocalypse virus and was seeking a way out. She thought marrying someone with genes similar to hers would somehow reduce the effects of the virus on her body. Only Guy, who was known as Triton, back then knew about Mana's dark side. However, he just couldn't find a way to tell Shu at the moment, as Mana was always around him. One time after confessing her feelings to little Shu, 
Mana kisses her younger brother on the lips and forbids him from saying anything. Anytime he was asleep or absent, she would show her real horrible self to Guy back then. One day she tells Guy about her plan to trick and marry Shu, just so she can be whole again. All Guy could do back then was open his mouth in both disgust and surprise. Back to the present day, Shu breaks himself off the crystal chains he was put in and watches Kato spread his blood on Inori's mouth. Thankfully for him, Guy, Ayase, and Tsugumi, Ayase's attendant, arrive just in time to stop the revival from happening. Guy rushes over to Shu and begs him to remember the events that happened on the day of Lost Christmas, as this would be crucial to stopping his sister from destroying the world a second time. Shu thinks long and hard about that exact day, and finally, it clicks. As it turns out, younger Guy had called him to the church in Tokyo just so he could tell him about his horrible sister. Sadly for him, Mana came first to give him her Christmas present, which was a gun. After giving him the gun, Mana orders Triton to shoot at a Christmas tree. Guy takes the shot and accidentally shoots himself. Just then, Shu arrives and finds his friend, Triton, on the ground. He rushes towards Triton and tries to revive his bloody body. This breaks Mana's heart so much that she loses control and lets the crystal out of her body. This sudden loss of control causes an explosion that engulfs the entire city of Tokyo. People all within the city were crystallized and vaporized into thin air. Now that he remembers everything that happened, Shu's conviction is stronger than ever before. He unlocks a new mode of himself, New King Mode, and undoes the memory shackles Dath placed on him. Guy tells Shu to draw out his own void and use it to return his elder sister to rest. Shu obliges and takes out Guy's void. Guy uses his void, which is a gun that forces other voids to manifest, to shoot Inori so she can draw out her longsword. Shu catches up to her and handles the sword to fight Kato and Dath. Dath renders Kato useless and knocks him out before taking him to their other domain. Meanwhile, Guy gets too close to Inori and ends up getting stabbed by Inori's memory shackles. Knowing full well he's going to die, Guy asks Shu to grant his final wish and stab Inori through him so they can stop Mana from reviving. Shu sheds a tear for Guy and stabs him and a half-revived Mana with Inori's longsword. In his final moments of life, Guy thanks the creator for finally meeting Mana, and then he disappears. Shu gets Inori back and cries his heart out for he just lost an integral part of the Undertaker team. Two weeks after the incident with Kato and Guy, the entire city of Tokyo is quarantined and secluded from the entire world. Shu and the other students in his high school are trapped on campus as the government places blockades to stop them from getting back to their homes. One morning, Ayase falls from her wheelchair, and as she tries crawling back to the chair, two dudes approach and try to harass her. Ayase tells them to leave her be and let her get back up by herself. However, the boys had something else in mind. As they inch closer to Ayase's chest, Tsugumi shows up and knocks them down. The boys get pissed and try to attack Tsugumi, but Shu and the others arrive and chase them away. Instead of saying thank you for helping her, Ayase asks for some privacy so she can struggle to get back in her wheelchair. Shu and the others let her be as they walk back to the conference room. There, they discuss the state of things around the school. The quarantine has made people quite restive and paranoid. Amidst the discussion, Sauda suggests they plan a festival to cheer the students up. This would be a good way to bring everyone together and quell the growing unrest between the students. Arisa, the current president of the student union, sees this as a good idea so she doesn't object to it. Yahiro, on the other hand, tries his very best to stop such a thing from happening. Sadly for him, it's not his place to decide. While Sagai and the other government officials plan something big for Tokyo, Shu and Yahiro are seen discussing a few things about voids and the like. Shu asks Yahiro about his sudden interest in voids. Yahiro tells him he's just curious and would like to know more about them. Ding Shu nods in agreement and heads back to the auditorium. There, he finds Hare and Tsugumi playing with one another. The atmosphere seems to be busy as all the students help set up the stage for the Egoist concert. By evening time, Tsugumi encounters a rich boy from Shu's class and gives him all her heavy load to carry. In the meantime, Ayase finally gets to meet Hare to discuss Shu. Hare thanks Ayase and the members of the Undertaker Rebel Group for changing Shu's life for the better. The rich boy from earlier, however, makes a secret call to Sigai to ask him about the progress of their latest plans. Sigai tells him there are still deliberations from the government and they would have to wait a few days before a conclusion is drawn. Everyone seems to be having a good time on the school grounds. A few meters away from the school, some rebels gather and shame the students for planning a party in the middle of a crisis. One of them arrives with a war robot and presents it to his peers as their new trump card. Ayase gets some time alone with Tsugumi and blames her for pulling the plug on her war robot back when she was fighting alongside Guy. Apparently, Ayase blames herself for Guy's death as she thought she could have done something to save him. Tsugumi refuses to say anything. Instead, she ups and leaves. Shu shows up a little while later to comfort Ayase, but before he finishes his speech, however, the rebels attack the school with their guns. Shu rides Ayase to safety 
but this annoys her so much that she knocks herself down from her wheelchair and begs Shu to help her stand on her own. Shu sees the state of her mind and helps her manifest her void. While the rebels attack the students, Ayase's void, which gives her mechanical legs, grants her temporary mobility and strength. She uses her strength to fly around and bring down the rebels. Shu also unsheathes the longsword from Inori's chest and uses it to take down all the rebels right in front of the students. When they're done taking down the entire rebel group, the entire school cheers them on. With the terrorists now subdued, the egoist concert begins. As Inori performs in front of the students, Ayase thanks Shu for letting her stand up for herself when the terrorists attack them. Tsugumi manages to get some signal from the radio tower in the city and uses it to power the large TV in the auditorium. When the TV comes back on, there's an emergency broadcast. Apparently, the government had decided all inhabitants of Loop 7 were to be isolated from the other parts of Japan so as to prevent the infection from spreading all throughout Japan. After hearing the dreadful news, the students convene in the gymnasium for an emergency meeting with the student council president, Arisa. Arisa begs the students to wait for intervention from her grandpa, but the students are sick and tired of waiting for help that may never come. Eventually, some of the students cause a ruckus, which causes unrest amongst the lot. At the concluding part of the meeting, Nanba, one of the students there, files a no-confidence charge against Arisa and proposes they impeach her from being president of the student council. After the meeting, the students all lined up at the clinic to get vaccinated against the virus. Shu and the others find out just how much the students hate Arisa. While the others defend her, Tsugumi talks down on her and tells them Arisa's not really cut out to lead the students. Somewhere else, Nanba and a few other students express their disgust at Arisa for being a wimp and crybaby. One of the students suggests they take her down, but Nanba calms them down and tells them to save that for later. Inori searches the entire school for Tsugumi and finds her by the lawn near the river. She settles down with Tsugumi and discusses their families. When they're done talking, Tsugumi calls out Shu, who was eavesdropping, and shows him the void measuring device she found lying somewhere after the terrorists were taken down. Shu collects the device and uses it to measure the void strength of those around him. After doing that, some of the students decide to check out Tsugumi's void. So they hold her down and ask Shu to take out her void. A few hours later, Kato and Seigai superseded the purification of Tokyo. This plan involved killing thousands of people living near the barricade, and then moving the barricades closer to shrink the quarantined land. Seigai and Kato give the go-ahead and those living near the barricade are purified before the barricades are pulled inside. News of the massacre gets to the school, and Arisa is put under even more pressure as she realizes the government doesn't give a damn about her and the students. Outside the quarantined area, Arisa's grandpa rallies up Argo and one other dude from The Undertakers to save his daughter and any other survivors still present inside the quarantined land. The next day after the massacre, rumors began to circulate around the school. According to some anonymous source, anybody who surrenders any Undertaker member would be allowed to go scot-free. This causes more unrest among the students as the bullies amongst the students begin searching the others violently for tattoos. At one point, the students search for Inori, hoping to find a tattoo that makes her out to be an undertaker. Inori takes care of them and walks down to meet Shu who is looking for her. As for Ayase, she gets harassed by a bunch of Nanba's boys. Tsugumi comes in to help her out, but the boys are just too strong for both girls so they're overpowered and captured. Arisa calls for another meeting with the other students. When they're all gathered, she tells them the same thing, to wait for grandpa's help. This time, Nanba and his boys take the stage to inform the students about the new undertaker rule. To prove their claims, they wheel in Ayase alongside Tsugumi so they can prove to everyone that there are undertakers living amongst them. When the screams and complaints get too much, Shu steps in to help. He introduces himself as an undertaker and asks the students to allow him to prove to them that the government doesn't give a damn about them. To do this, he uses Tsugumi's void to create clones of himself, Ayase, Tsugumi herself, and another student. Now the student takes them towards the gate and surrenders Ayase and the others as members of the undertaker gang. To everyone's dismay, both the students and Ayase's people are all shot on the spot. Shu pulls away the feed and tells everyone that they're always going to be on their own. They shouldn't put too much trust in the government. Nanba still tries to reject Shu's judgment, but Shu deals with him harshly. Just as he's about to leave the stage, Yahiro steps up and proposes that everybody vote for Shu to be the new leader of the Student Union Council. Everybody gives their vote to Shu to be the new leader of the Student Leader Council, as they applaud him. After the meeting, Yahiro proposes a void ranking system to Shu, a ranking system that considers people with powerful voids to be more important than those with lower ranks. Shu, after hearing about Yahiro's void ranking plan, refuses to implement it to avoid discrimination among students. Instead, 
He tries the gentler approach by allowing the students to explore their void powers to the fullest and work together to rebuild both themselves and their school. Things go on normally in the school premises with Shu as their leader. However, one thing's certain, and that's the fact that the red line keeps coming closer to the school, and if Shu doesn't think of something very soon, they may all die. Yahiro keeps pestering him to use the void ranking system just so they can get their affairs in order, but Shu stands his ground. One day, while at dinner with his friends, Shu asks them for advice on the best course of action. While the others choose to tease him, Inori advises him to reason deeply about what he truly wants for the people. After dinner, Ayase, Tsugumi, and Hare all soak themselves in the public pool. There, Hare asks Ayase if she knows what's going on with Inori and Shu. Tsugumi gets very sassy and teases Hare for being concerned about Shu's personal business. Hare gets a little embarrassed and stops the questions. In the meantime, Shu finds Suda on the roof of one of the school's buildings and stands with him to discuss a little. There, Sauda finds out about the void ranking system Yahiro wants Shu to implement and gets very pissed at Shu for even considering it. Shu assures him that he would never do such a thing to promote discrimination. Sauda heaves a sigh of relief and laughs with his friend again. After his meeting with Sauda, Shu returns to his quarters with a happy face. However, the news he hears there isn't good at all. They were running out of vaccines already, and if care isn't taken, there won't be enough for all the students. Yahiro uses this to push his void ranking agenda to Shu, encouraging him to give it a try. The very next day, Yahiro circulates the void rankings throughout the entire school. Sauda and a few other students notice they have the lowest ranking in the school. They gather themselves to see Shu and speak to him. When the point they get to their meeting with him, Sauda asks Shu to give himself and the others a few more times so they can practice and raise their void rankings, hopefully. Right outside the red line, Daryl receives a call from Segai ordering him to go search for the students and take them out before they become the next Undertaker. Daryl tries to convince Segai to avoid unnecessary manslaughter, but Segai lets him know that it has to be done. Hare, on the other hand, notices that Shu's missing. She tracks him to the abandoned building and comforts him. Shu keeps calm and rests his head on Hare's chest. Seconds later, Shu receives a call from one of the scouts informing him about Sauda and a bunch of other students with a low void ranking who just left the school premises on a mission. Shu boards his vehicle and finds Sauda and his people on their way to a hospital to salvage a few vaccines for the apocalypse disease. As he tries to speak sense into their heads, government attack helicopters show up and attack them. Sauda and the others run for dear life while Shu leads the helicopters away from them. Daryl, on seeing that Shu is still alive, wonders whether the little runt, Tsugumi, would be alive as well. As the fight goes on, Suda convinces Hare to heal up a particular car so they can use it to escape their enemies. While Hare revives the car, one of the enemy war robots catches up to her and blows her up with the car. Shu jumps into the explosion, hoping to save Hare, only to get caught up in the explosion itself. Yahiro and Inori arrive shortly to help Shu out. They manage to take down all the attack helis and robots before they destroy their friends totally. Meanwhile, Hare uses every last bit of willpower left in her half-dead body to heal Shu's body and revive him. She heals him up for a few seconds before she's shot by the genomic weapon from one of the attack helicopters. Shu wakes up and finds Hare's body already covered in the apocalypse crystal. He tries to pick her up, but it is already too late, as Hare's body gets engulfed in the crystals and vaporizes into thin air. Hare's death flips a switch in Shu's head as he gets up like a madman, removes Inori's longsword void, and cuts down all the war robots and machines there to attack them. Sauda and the others are all shocked by the immense power Shu displayed to take down the enemies. After all the hubbub died down, Sauda gets up and keeps apologizing for causing Hare to heal the dilapidated car. If he hadn't forced Hare to heal up the car, then she would still be alive. Shu loses control of his emotions and punches Sauda down for causing Hare's death. Yahiro steps in and brings Shu to order. After crying, Shu finally agrees to implement the void ranking system. Several thousand feet in the air, a military plane opens its hatch to drop Argo and his partner down to the infected part of Tokyo so they can retrieve Arisa and take her to her grandpa. Apparently, her grandpa plans on making her marry the leader of the Minghua group just so he can negotiate with the Association of Asian Countries on his behalf. When they reach the designated spot, Argo and his partner drop from the plane and parachute down to the quarantined area. Argo lands safely and tries to find the school Arisa is in. On his way there, he finds some members of a secret service harassing a few students. Argo hides out of sight to check out what is going on, only to find out the students are being harassed because they were escaping Shu's reign. Hearing that Shu has been in charge of the school, he reveals himself and follows the students to the school. When he gets there, he arranges a meeting with Shu and sees him face to face. Argo gets the shock of his life after seeing just how dark Shu's become. Shu demonstrates a void performance exam in front of Argo who interrupts him. 
On seeing him, Shu welcomes him to the school and asks about his business with them. Argo tells Shu that he's there to retrieve Orisa, but Yahiro cuts in and tells Argo that Shu's currently busy and can't attend to him. Instead, they can talk and walk while Shu carries out his daily tasks. Naturally, Argo has no problem with this, so he accompanies Shu and his people to the docks. There, he finds the lower-level students working together to salvage a sunken warship for vaccines and supplies. As they inspect the entire thing, Sauda's oxygen pump develops a fault, and Sauda's trapped underwater with only minutes left to live. Instead of arranging for someone to help him, Shu orders the students to wait for Sauda to get out of the water by himself. Argo is disgusted by the kind of person Shu's become. He ignores Shu's orders and heads off to help rejuvenate Suda's oxygen tank. Shu gets very pissed and holds Argo at gunpoint. There. He makes it clear to Argo that they won't be releasing Orisa to him seeing as her void is very useful to them. In conclusion, Shu gives Argo two choices. He either swears obedience to him or dies a painful death. Argo damns the consequences and chooses to die before answering the horrible person who calls himself Shu. Shu has Argo detained and put in a cell for his disdainful actions. By nightfall, Tsugumi uses her robot to update Argo on the recent happenings in the school. Elsewhere, Ayasi tries to speak some sense into Shu's head, but it backfires on her so much that she slaps him. Shu thanks her stars that nobody was around or else he won't be able to overlook it. Argo, after hearing the full story behind Shu's actions, decides he's going to do something about it before the entire school system comes crashing down. Elsewhere, Haruka and Segai meet and discuss their recent plans for the students. In the meantime, Arisa shows up to interview the Undertaker member they captured earlier. Yahiro, on the other hand, spends his night dispelling rumors that are surfacing around the school. Apparently, there are some people who believe Hare died because her void was broken. Even though there may be some truth to this, Yahiro still refuses to believe it. Shu meets with Inori to talk to her. During their discussion, he receives news that Argo, one of the Undertakers, has escaped custody. Almost immediately, Yahiro, Shu, and the others all spread out to search for Argo. Shu and one other lady find Argo in the gymnasium and order him to stop and surrender himself. This time, Argo gets really pissed off and decides to attack Shu. He takes out his knife and pins him down as he tries to talk some sense into his head. Yahiro arrives a while later and points his gun at Argo after ordering him to stop. Argo steps back a little bit and surrenders himself to Yahiro's authority. Just then, something weird happens. A beam from the ceiling falls down and breaks the girl's void. Almost immediately, the girl transforms into a crystal and is vaporized into thin air. It was then Shu discovered that Yahiro had been lying to him all along and that the rumors were actually true. Shu gets very pissed at Yahiro for what he did and asks him for the way forward. Yahiro tells him there's no going back now, or else they risk facing certain death from the virus. Argo gets tired of all the bullcrap and tells Shu to get back to his true self before there's a rebellion. Shu nods in agreement, walks closer to him, and pulls out his void before threatening him to keep mute. Nearby, Inori catches Arisa trying to escape the school premises with some other ladies and injures them to stop them from escaping. Arisa's grandpa receives a call from the leader of the Ming Hua group telling him the deal is off. Haruka wishes her son would forgive her for what she's about to do. Just before the scene goes black, a ripped man emerges from his incubation tank. The next night, Shu finds a group of his scouts slacking off and checking out the government barricade. Shu walks by with his guards and finds them abandoning their stations. The students try to explain their predicament, but Shu detains and punishes them for neglecting their duties. On getting back to their school hideout, Shu continues planning for their next big mission. Yahiro finds him in the war room and talks to him about the growing resentment amongst the students. Shu explains why his choice of ruling is the best. According to him, there would be no discipline if he ruled with his emotions. Just then, Inori, who was with them in the room, recalls her last meeting with Arisa. Apparently, she was possessed by something dangerous and this caused her to injure Arisa earlier. Shu notices the worried look on Inori's face and checks to make sure she is okay. Thankfully, she is. Arisa, on the other hand, receives a call in her dungeon. She explains the horrible situation Shu is putting them through, and this catches the attention of her guard who walks in to find her on the phone. Without thinking, the guard confiscates the phone from Arisa's hand and threatens to report her to Shu. However, Arisa bribes him by putting his hands on her chest. Elsewhere, Nanba and the other rebels spread a rumor all around the school about Hare's death. Their theory proposes that Hare died because her void was broken. Seeing this, the students get very upset at Shu for using them, and they plan their revenge against him. Several thousand meters away from Tokyo, a group of government officials from the UN sit to discuss their next plans for Japan. Meanwhile, Arisa's guard questions her about spreading false rumors about voids. Arisa begins convincing him to accept the rumor as the truth. Elsewhere, Inori meets up with Shu to discuss a few things with him. She tells him she's scared of what she's becoming and that sometimes, 
She would black out only to wake up with no memory of what she did at the last second. Shu hugs her and tells her she'll be fine. Just then, Yahiro shows up to reveal the person who attacked Arisa. He lets Shu know that Inori was the one who attacked Arisa. As such, they have to mete out the necessary punishment to Inori so they can keep the law and order around the school. Shu flares and gets really tired of Yahiro's stand-up act. Now he clearly knows Yahiro never thought of him as a friend, and had just been using him as his puppet all along. Arisa gets her payment for helping spread the rumor about voids breaking to the students. Arisa, after getting her payment, which is a document containing the date and time of the Exodus event, promises to remove the current Emperor Shu from his throne on the day of the Exodus operation. A few nights later, Shu rallies up all remaining students present in the school and marches with them for a whopping four kilometers to the barricade. Segai, Kato, and Haruka all witness the entire thing happen from the safety of their big labs. Dath, on the other hand, awakens a dead person and gives him instructions on how to proceed. As soon as they arrive at the Tokyo Tower, Shu makes his plans known to the students. If things go well, he plans on getting close to the tower and destroying it so the enemy won't be able to control their war robots anymore. Then, they would pass through the red line without getting massacred. Moments after he finishes his speech, the war robots attack. Shu kickstarts the operation and the students all rush towards their enemy. Minutes into the fight, almost half of the students are massacred by the war robots. Shu takes a minute to reflect on his plans before mustering up the courage to see it through to the end. He takes out Inori's longsword and races towards the Tokyo Tower. On getting there, he slashes down all the war robots present there and finally takes down the tower. Almost immediately, all the war robots attacking the students power down, and the students begin crossing the red line finally. Shu meets up with Inori and asks her to follow the students through the red line. However, Nanba and the others show their true colors. Suddenly, all the students turn against Shu and throw him into a crater for his sins. Inori runs after Shu to check up on him, but then she's stopped when a sword is sunk into her back. Guy shows up then, after, and sights Shu in the crater. He gets down to meet Shu and cuts his right hand, which is the hand housing the guilty crown power. Guy then transforms the hand into some power and attaches it to himself. At that instant, the UN voted in favor of purging the whole of Japan. Once they finalize their votes, they send fighter jets to the vicinity to drop explosive RM rounds on the entire city. Guy, however, regains the power that was rightfully his, the guilty crown power. At that instant, Daryl and other units in their war robots are given an order to protect Guy at all costs. This comes as a shock to them, but they have no choice. The fighter jets arrive at the location above and drop the RM warheads on the city. Guy immediately harvests Nanba and his people's void, and then uses it to create a large missile before sending it straight to the fighter jet above. The missile not only destroys all the RM rounds, but also takes down the jet deploying them. Just then, Nanba and the other two students who had their voids taken by Guy are crystallized and turned into smoke. Ayase and Sugumi, after seeing Guy, immediately rush towards him to check up on his health. Guy, however, tells them he's not the same person he used to be. He's stronger and more stern now. If they don't obey him, he will be forced to take them down. That instant, one of the war robots rushes in to protect Guy. Daryl, however, refuses to protect someone like Guy as he rushes towards him to take him down. The war robots shoot Daryl's robot to immobilize him. Amidst the ruckus, Argo picks Tsugumi and Ayas up to escape to a safer location. Guy, however, gets into his transport vehicle and is transported back to his base. Arisa pledges her allegiance to Guy and promises to follow his every order if he can protect her. Guy agrees to her terms and lets her on his team. Just outside the coast of Japan, a fleet of UN warships prepared themselves to launch missiles towards Japan so they could destroy them totally. Moments before they fire, a leucocyte satellite opens fire at the fleet and sinks all the ships there. Guy broadcasts an emergency message to the UN and the rest of the world, warning them to refrain from intervening in Japan's affairs. Failure to do so would mean war against Japan, and he would be forced to fight them with all the 200 leucocytes under his command. Following this emergency broadcast, the UN ceased operations to purge Japan from the rest of the world. Three days later, silence erupts in the streets of Tokyo, Japan. Arisa's grandpa gets the full story behind his aligning with someone like Guy. He gets very distraught and makes a final decision to regain his family's honor. Inori goes on a scavenger hunt to find food for the injured Shu. Arisa, on the other hand, joins her new colleagues at Guy's facility. There, she gets to know a few things about the facility. Sagai also plays chess with another Undertaker member. He loses the game and promises to do his part of the deal, which is to set up a meeting with Guy. Later on, Guy's people get discovered by Arisa's grandpa. There's a small shootout outside the building, but Arisa quickly rushes outside to stop it before it's too late. She faces her grandpa, who expresses his disappointment over her choice of allegiance. Three other men appear to protect Arisa, but her grandpa takes them all down 
and goes towards his granddaughter to end her life. Arisa, however, thinks fast and shoots her grandpa in the belly with her revolver pistol. One of the men stands back up and thanks her for her help. Just then, Inori gets out of her hiding place and wonders why Guy is after her. As she rushes back to her hideout, she's approached by a group of disgruntled men. Inori blacks out for a few minutes and wakes up to see the men all battered up and dead. She clenches her fist and rushes back to the hideout as fast as her legs can carry her. When she gets there, she finds Shu there and hugs him tightly as tears roll down her cheek. Arisa, after getting back to her building, orders her men to dispatch an endlave to find Inori. Inori, on the other hand, wakes up and keeps reminding herself that she's not a monster. She fears that if she keeps blacking and killing people, she will one day terminate Shu as well. After recalling the good times she had with Shu, she musters up the courage to sing out her egoist song again for Shu to hear. After singing her heart out, she walks towards Shu who is crying and urges him not to hate himself anymore. She tells him to let her sacrifice herself so he would be safe, but Shu protests against this. Knowing fully well he would stop her, Inori puts Shu to sleep and heads out to find her enemies. She walks for a few meters and finds a dozen war robots waiting for her. She suddenly turns into monster mode and lets out all her power to fight the robots. Guy gets tired of the fight at one point and intervenes. He subdues her and ties void cords all around her. A few hours later, Shu wakes up to find out Inori's totally gone. After tying the void cords around Inori, Guy dips his hand inside her chest and takes out her void. Segai, who's nearby, records the entire event with his phone and stores it for safekeeping. Elsewhere, Harka sneaks into the storage room of the GHQ facility, hoping to find her revived daughter, Mana, there. Sadly for her, she finds Kato there, who accuses her of being an idealist who never gives up. Haruka holds Kato at gunpoint and demands to know about her son's whereabouts. However, Kato is in no mood for negotiations, so he takes out his own gun and shoots Haruka. Just right outside the facility, Shu shows up and sneaks to Arisa's back. He places a gun at her back and urges her to show him Inori. Before she could say anything, an emergency broadcast was sent to her and all personnel naming Haruka to be a traitor who stole an important cargo. After watching the footage from the storage room, Segai opens his eyes wide and asks Kato to let him go after her. In the meantime, Arisa borrows a vehicle and hides Shu inside it. Then she orders him to drive the vehicle towards Haruka's location so she can finally get to meet her. Haruka, on the other hand, arrives at the Kunhoin mansion only to find out that the leader, Arisa's grandpa, is already dead. She finds Kurachi, an old friend, and reminisces about good times with her. After catching up, she enters the building and finds other members of the Undertakers there. After settling in, she has a nice little chat with the people there and recalls the wonderful moments she once had with Shu. So it turns out Haruka wasn't really Shu's biological mom as it's revealed that she was remarried to his dad, Uma Kurosu. Segai and his team find and interrogate a woman on the whereabouts of the Undertaker hideout. After confirming his suspicions, he arranges for his people to disguise themselves in Mufti so they can fool the Undertaker people and enter their place. His plans work as the Undertakers fall under their trap. When they find Segai amidst his men, it's already too late as they've already let them in. Segai orders his men to open fire on everybody inside the room and all hell breaks loose. Ugumo protects Haruka with his life and makes sure she escapes Segai's deadly claws. Unfortunately for him, he loses his life. Haruka joins Karachi on her double bike and they ride toward their last hope with the void genome Haruka stole. Ayase, Tsugumi, and the other undertakers all wait for Argo and the other scouts to return with news about Ugumo's base. When they return, they come bearing bad news. Ugumo and the others are dead. Haruka arrives at that instant and pays her final respects to the fallen hero, Ugumo. Another former member of the Undertaker rebel group meets up with Guy in his new hideout. He shames Guy for taking the lowest path of life he could ever take, but Guy doesn't seem to care at all about whatever the guy feels. The guy then smiles and promises to take down Guy with all his might. By nightfall, Haruka and Ayase meet to talk about the void genome in her possession. Haruka tells her Shu may probably be the one to use such a drug when the time comes. During their discussion, Sagai and his war robots discover their location. Somewhere on the highway close to the hideout, Shu yeets himself out of Arisa's car and heads straight off to Guy and his people. Argo and the other Undertakers prepare themselves to fight Segai and his men. Ayase, however, begs Haruka to let her use the Void Genome just so she can bring Segai down once and for all. Haruka bends down to take out the Genome drug, but Segai catches up to them and stops Ayase from doing such a thing. He shoots the Genome out of Haruka's hands and promises to take it for himself. Ayase distracts him and transports herself down to the Void Genome. Segai follows her, kicks her off her wheelchair, and pushes the Void Genome away from her. Shu arrives shortly and finds the Void Genome drug lying very close to him. He picks it up and injects the drug into his system, despite several warnings and objections from his mother and others. Suddenly, Shu's body undergoes an incredible transformation and he becomes the new king of the Guilty Crown. In a matter of minutes, 
Shu acquires a new guilty crown insignia on his left hand, materializes another right hand, borrows a few voids from his former colleagues, and uses it to take down all of Segai's war robots. Segai gets himself into a war robot and pilots it to take down Shu. However, Shu catches up to him and cuts down Seagulls, which in turn kills him. After taking care of Segai and his war robots, Shu's body begins developing crystal cancer. Just then, it's known that Shu's void allows him to take in the bad sides of other people's voids and take them all into himself. Guy immediately receives the news of Shu's revival from Kato. He refuses to think of it as anything special and just focuses on reviving Mana instead. He looks up and asks Mana, who's already halfway through being fully revived, if she is okay. Mana admits to Inori being a strong lady, but then again, it's nothing she can't handle. Yahiro and the other students travel by ship to another location. On their way, Guy releases another broadcast message. Everyone rushes to listen to what the most powerful man in the world has to say. Guy expresses his disappointment in the UN for going against his warnings and still trying to invade Japan. He concludes that the UN has chosen death over its own survival. As such, he would unleash all the leukocytes in his possession against them all. However, this time, he would allow the remaining citizens of Japan to decide the fate of the UN. After hearing the message, Karachi and the other remnants of the Kuhuin group all gather up and ask Shu to fight alongside them. Argo gets curious and asks the other people to tell him what Guy intends to do with all the firepower at his disposal. Shibungi, the guy who met with Guy earlier, shows up and tells them Guy is about to cause the fourth apocalypse on the entire world. Hearing this, he shows the others Kurosu's diary. Shu opens his mouth in surprise as he realizes he's a few meters closer to learning all the secrets of his dad. On the other hand, Kato narrates the history between himself and Shu's father, Kurosu, to Guy. It all began several years ago in college when Kurosu's genomic resonance theory made the highlights and resonated well with Kato's only friend, Kurosu. One day, as he rushes over to spill the good news to Kurosu, he finds him sleeping with a beautiful student, Seiko. Months later, Seiko became pregnant with Mana at the time. Kurosu eventually got married to her and lived a happy life for five years. By 2022, a meteorite containing an amino acid bonding crystal crashes into the Earth. Kato and his partner Kurosu came together and spent the next year analyzing the crystal. After several tests and analyses, they discovered that the crystal had a virus attached to it. Seeing as Mana was the first person to come in contact with the crystal, she was named the Eve of Evolution. One day, both scientists got a visit from Dath who predicted the future of mankind. He tells them about the lost Christmas apocalypse and warns Kurosu to let his current wife give birth to the baby inside her before she dies. After Shu is born, Kurosu shuts down and prevents himself from discussing with Dath. Kato, on the other hand, kept close contact with Dath and continued searching for the solution to the mystery of evolution and natural selection. Along the line, Kato begins trafficking lost children and performing dangerous experiments on them to create a strongly resistant specimen to the crystal. Guy was amongst the children Kato and his people abducted for their experiments. One night, he escaped the facility and fled into the ocean only to end up meeting Mana and her younger brother Shu at the time. A few months pass by and Kurosu meets Haruka, Kato's younger sister. Haruko took pity on Kurosu's lonely way of life and decided to be there by his side till he found what he was looking for. She makes sure to let her brother know first before getting married to him. In her first year as Kurosu's wife, she helps the children with their stuff and makes sure she's there with them. However, some years later, in 2029, hell broke loose and the world was plunged deep into an apocalypse. Moments before the disaster happened, Kato had paid Kurosu a visit to talk to him about Dath's impatience. He checks out Kurosu's diary and finds a little strange information in there. Kurosu catches him doing so and questions him on it. Kato threatens Kurosu to tell him about the solution to the mystery of evolution or face being killed by death. Kurosu remains indifferent about the entire thing and asks for more time. Kato gets very pissed at Kurosu for wasting his time. He puts him down, takes out his gun, and shoots Kurosu to death. Moments after taking out her father, Mana lets go of her power and destroys Tokyo. Back in the present day, Haruka finishes an MRI scan on Shu's body. As he changes back to his clothes, Haruka explains just how well Guy has been manipulating him to collect other people's voids just so he can revive most of Mana's power. Just then, the attack helicopters get fueled and ready for their infiltration. Before leaving, Shu gets back outside and plans to return the voids of the others back to them. Just before he does that, Yahiro and the others step up and prevent him from risking his life just so he can be good to a few people. Shu checks to make sure they're all really fine with him using their void. When he gets the go-ahead from them all, including Sauda, whom he reconciles with for causing Hare's death. He then gets up and leaves with the army for their last and greatest fight in the entire series. Meanwhile, Guy recalls the first moments he had after he was reborn into the world. Dath, who was with him at the time, 
reminds him of his roles and duty in birthing a new world of evolutionary species after the fourth apocalypse. Guy snaps back to the present and checks up on Mana who is still reviving. Mana complains about Inori's stubbornness again but then tells Guy she will be up and running in no time. Shu and his people set up their base near the seaport. They scout ahead and find several of the UN ships lying in wait for anything to happen. They contemplate why Guy never attacked any of them, despite getting closer to his base. Then they conclude that Guy must have been bluffing about the 256 leukocytes he claimed to have in his possession. Suddenly, the team is reinvigorated by Shu and Shubungi. They now have a greater conviction to take down Guy and his people. Everyone straps up to get ready for the greatest fight of their lives. Before leaving their base, Shu meets with Ayase and asks if she'll be fine with him borrowing her void for the fight with Guy. Ayase tells him she's perfectly fine with it, as long as he returns it in one piece. Moving on, the UN and their fleet approach Guy's base and threaten to take him down if he doesn't surrender. Guy sighs and borrows void powers from Dath and two other people which he uses to take down the entire air fleet and about 87% of the UN's forces. In the meantime, Daryl and his people all get up and ready to fight their enemies. Daryl checks out his war robot one more time before heading out to face his worst enemy, Ayase and Shu. And so the war for the fate of the world begins with Shu and Ayase sending a decoy from Sugumi's void just to test the front lines. Daryl and his people fall for the bait and shoot at the decoy. When they find out, it's already too late as they've already given out their location. Tsugumi hacks into Guy's systems and remotely shuts down the war robots. Shu, on the other hand, infiltrates the base from their underground basement. When they get in, they split up with Shu going on his own to find and rescue Inori. With just minutes left for Mana to be fully revived, Guy lets Inori say her final goodbyes before she shut down forever. Inori thanks Guy for giving her life and wishes he can atone for the sins he has committed. Guy asks her about Shu and the feeling she has for him. Inori tells him the reason why she fell for him. He's just too human to be true. He's made mistakes, gotten back from them, and became stronger with every passing adversity. Guy opens his mouth wide in surprise as the crystal engulfs Inori. He asks her one last question, who is Shu? At that point, Inori's memories were already gone. She begins singing a song only Shu can hear. Thankfully, she gets the message across, and Shu follows the sound of her voice and eventually tracks her down. He rallies up with his people and gets to the central command room only to find Dath and Kido there waiting for them. Argo and the others try to attack Dath, but he soon takes care of all of them. He then separates the room to isolate himself and Shu. Before fighting Shu, he asks him just one question. Now that Shu has awakened his king's power, he is considered to be on par with Guy at the moment. As the envoy for evolution and natural selection, Dath asks Shu if he really plans on rebirthing the world after the fourth apocalypse. Naturally, Shu refuses to do such a thing and this disappoints Dath a little. As a result, he decides to strip Shu of his king title. To do this, he borrows voids from his subordinates and uses them to fight Shu. Shu takes the voids he's gathered from his people and attacks Dath. Daryl also gets his revenge on Tsugumi for destroying his pride back then. During their fight, Dath accuses Shu of sacrificing everything he has for someone like Inori. This touches Shu in a not-so-good way as he gets angrier and attacks Dath with all he has. Doth also returns the attacks with the same potency, but Shu eventually takes him down. Moments before disappearing, Doth dares Shu to take down Guy and Mana. As Mana engulfs Inori in a crystal, Inori sheds one last teardrop, and this teardrop transforms itself into a small crystalline flower that blooms ever so slightly. Mana's fully revived as she faces her new path in life as the eve of humans' next evolutionary species. Guy tells Shu to abandon any of his plans to rescue Inori, as it's already too late for that. Meanwhile, Daryl decides to go all out to take down the Undertakers. Tsugumi tries to keep her hacks up and running, but then again, Guy's henchman, Kido Kenji, sits at the other end countering all of Tsugumi's hacks. In the meantime, Mana descends from her revival chamber and says hi to her younger brother Shu and her person Triton. She tells Shu just how hard it was for her to revive herself and come back to life in this form. She also mentions the stubbornness of Inori and calls her a monster. Shu gets very pissed and pushed back after telling her that she's the real monster and not Inori. Mana becomes very annoyed and calls Shu mean for talking down on her like she's even a saint in the first place. Guy knows full well what will happen if things get out of control, so he steps up and asks Mana to leave the rest to him. He then takes out her void and begins the fourth apocalypse ritual on the entire world this time, not just Japan. Mana gets back up and begins her own song to bring the greatest apocalypse to the entire world. The world feels the effects of the song in a matter of minutes. Suddenly, the genomic resonance scale is off the charts, and people all over the world start turning into cancerous crystals. Shu borrows Yahiro's shears to fight Guy. Daryl, on the other hand, injects himself with a void genome just so he can get powerful enough to beat down the Undertakers. Well, this works for just a few minutes as Daryl actually takes down some of the Undertakers. 
However, things take a turn for the worse as the genome drug begins to eat up his body. Shu and Guy keep fighting and arguing about their morals. Haruka, however, finds her brother staring at a screen and threatens to end his life right there with a gun for all the things he's caused for herself and her son. Kato, who seems to have wanted death for a long time, succumbs to Haruka's threats and surrenders to death. Tsugumi, on the other hand, struggles to keep up with Kenji's hacks as her entire system begins malfunctioning. Argo tells her to keep up while he finds Kido. Shu ends up getting beat up by Guy. Just when he's about to give in to despair, he looks at the flower from Inori's teardrop earlier and sees an apparition of Inori who tells him not to give up. He draws the power from the flower and uses it to counter Mana's powers. Shubhangi catches on to Kido and takes him out before he completely takes down their systems. Just then, Inori's voice begins to echo everywhere around Guy's base, and Shu gets back on his feet stronger than ever to take down Guy. Guy refuses to back down as well, and he himself races towards Shu to take him down. Shu retrieves Inori's body and pursues Guy until he catches and slashes him. All of a sudden, Mana's body disintegrates into the crystals and Inori is restored. Kato also gets infected with the cancerous crystal and dies out. Guy, on the other hand, finally gets to smile moments before his life ends. Before he dies, however, he shows Shu what the world would be like if the fourth apocalypse had been completed. He then mentions to Shu that he was always afraid of being selected as his greatest wish was to be with Mana forever. Even after Mana lost her life at Lost Christmas, Dath and the others at the Natural Selection Organization never allow her to die in peace. As a result, he decided to be the devil and force Shu to kill him and Mana together just so they could avoid being reincarnated again. With tears on his face, Guy hugs Mana and disappears into the void with her. Shu stands there and stares into space. Inori inches towards him with the cancerous crystals all over her body. She hugs Shu and proposes they make the biggest sacrifice of all. Without giving it a second thought, Shu raises his hands up and begins to absorb all the cancerous crystals on all those people who have been infected. Hope is suddenly rejuvenated amongst the Undertakers as they now have a better chance at taking down the enemies. Daryl gets saved from certain and is given a second chance at life. Before dying, Inori decides to sacrifice herself to save the entire world, as her destiny entails. She absorbs all the cancerous crystals and disappears with the sorrows of everybody. Shu stands there and allows the entire building to crash down on him. Thankfully, Argo arrived just in time to save him. A few years after the fourth apocalypse attempt, Yahiro, Ayase, Sugumi, Sauda, and a few other students all gather around to celebrate the anniversary of the Fallen Ones. In the final moments of the series, Shu sits down on an outdoor bench and finally smells the air for any sense of Inori, his first and last love. At this point, we have reached the end of our video. If you like it, do not forget to put the like button and subscribe for more new videos.